so it's, because and, and that's why a lot of these potting soil mixers will too we oftentimes let them rest for a little while because we add fertilizers that are now going to rot or break down into the soil, and we don't want to plant immediately into that depending on how much we add. No, you don't. Not in ideal conditions. You want, uh, like, we, we stack stuff out here and we, we age it for years. I mean, we, we make our own compost, which we use for our <laughs> potting mix when we do it. And we, we put a lot of our humic acid in it, right, you know, in the initial stages of composting. It's sort of like priming the pump. It's priming the pump. You have to look at it that way. In other words, That's great. So I've never your, used your humic process. I make my own thermal compost in a few months and run it through a warm bin, and then I end up using it later. Could I put some of your full humic in my compost pile when I'm activating? It'd be a very wise move because, for one thing, it has an amino acid called uh, thiocene, thiocene, okay? Now, this is why we're not seeing earthworms because after years of farming, you know, these amino acids break down. They're unstable. They're not being replenished. And for years, I, I, I we'd sell people humic acid, the raw stuff, or the soluble stuff, and they'd see earthworm reappearing. Okay, I, we never knew why that was until recently. It's, it's, it's about amino acid thiosine. So it's, it's a crucial component of the whole food chain, which earthworms are crucial. And I believe me, I'm a definite believer in vermicompost, big time. Uh, because if an earthworm eats it, uh, it's done. It's good. I mean, I had a vermicomposting uh, uh, in in Hawaii, and I and I, you know, and a lot of people did. A lot of organic farmers did, and, we, and that's what we use for our growing media. So yeah. that's about the. And then of course, we sell <laughs> our company sells to uh, lots of folks that do earthworm uh, products. Let's say. Good to know. Uh, lots of. Yeah, uh, they use our product in, 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 in conjunction with vermicompost, big time. And also, uh, they use our product TM7 in the, uh, uh, compost tea world. Because you make compost tea, you can make compost, but what if you use materials that are deficient in trace elements? Then you, yeah. you end up with your compost. Yeah, if your compost was made from a waste product on your land and your land didn't have the trace minerals in it to start, yeah, precisely, and that's where TM7 comes in. TM7 is uh, our full humic, which is our converted humic acid, soluble, mostly soluble, that's reacted in our biological process with specific additions of trace elements in the exact right proportion for most soil conditions. In other words, there's iron, cobalt, molybdenum, and they're required for nitrogen fixing and most... Uh, microbial activity. It also has selenium, but then it has the biggies like manganese, zinc, iron, you know. Yeah. But all in the right proportion, not just shotgun. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is what we find is the missing link. There's there's several missing links here. Yeah, one of them is trace elements <clears throat> and a specific balance. And then the other is the humic substances, which is really enzymes, uh, polyphenols, complex <laughs> stuff, chelators, you know, all that. So, you know, that that's actually part of my research work uh, on my master's degree in agronomy was uh, what are the limiting factors of, of plant yield and growth? What's holding us back? You know? Yeah, and that's what I tell people and, when we look at their soil test and we're looking at uh, an additive to use. I always suggest PM7 to make sure we're not having any limiting factors with some of those trace minerals. Yeah, that's so crucial. And then you have the disease factors here, too. Now, I discovered this stuff in Montana in 1972. Uh, I had an old farm, that I bought a little ranch, a few acres, and it was overgrazed. How am I going to fix this? You know, I was a back-to-the-lander, you know. You know, I wasn't a city hippie. You know, I was, like, back-to-the-land, you know, that kind of guy, right? Uh, and... So I, I heard about something called humic acids or humate, and I did a little test with corn, and, and the results were huge. Okay, so then it led to me as a consultant working with seed potato producers. Let's try some on a 40-acre field. Let's strip the field half with, half without. And this was just the raw stuff from New Mexico, really low grade. 
And what I saw was the where we treated the potatoes, there wasn't any insect damage. Right to the row where we didn't treat, they, it, they were like Swiss cheese. There was all kinds of uh, leaf-eating insect damage. It was dramatic, right to the row. You know, what? You know, and of course, I was <laughs> an entomologist, and, you know, I mean, so I saw something there that this could save the world. I mean, we could eliminate pesticides. This is amazing. Okay. That's what got me started on this. And there is something there, you know, and again, it's, it's, it's things like uh, polyphenols, what they call quinones. These are our different compounds that plants use to protect themselves in nature. And they are concentrated in these humic substances. And so plants, if you follow your spray or it's taken up by the root system, these protective compounds are, are present. And they tend to repel insects. They tend to be antiviral. The Chinese are really, they really know about this stuff. The Chinese use this stuff on millions of acres, okay? And they've done research, which I had translated into English, which shows the fulvic acid uh, curing major plant diseases. You know, of course, this is deadly in the U.S. We don't want this. You know, this is too well, cheap. It's, uh, you know, it's no good. When you talk it's, about it's, uh, China, I always have to think. I've got this book, maybe you've heard of it, called Farmers of 40 Centuries, Organic Farming in China. Oh, yeah. China, I, I mean, that's the... That's the classic book, yeah. Well, I think about it, I go, 40 centuries, and they haven't messed it up yet. Man, we've had a couple hundred years, and <laughs> they started getting kind of bad on our farm ground. So. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, okay, you have a different philosophy in general, okay, from China to here. We're, we're mechanistic. We're industrial. Uh, we uh, are looking at things as uh, reactive. In other words, our, me our, our medical system is treating symptoms. Okay, so we, we're always treating symptoms. You got an insect, kill it. You got a bacteria, you find something to kill it. Okay, well, it's holistic in, in Asia. Asian medicine is like Asian agriculture. It's more preventative. It's more understanding of the causes of things. And that's why they have a very advanced herbal medicine. That's why they... In, in the hospital system, they make fulvic acid in China at the Nanking Naval Hospital in Peking, and whom I'm in contact with their pharmacist. Uh, it's a crucial health product. It's a crucial part of their medicine. It's a crucial part of their agriculture. I actually drink they drink some of the full power. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that, but I do drink it personally from time to time. So. On purpose. A lot of people do. Yeah, a lot it's of on people purpose. do. It. Well, just check, and you never you know. You just be like, good check. for you, yeah. good for yeah. your plants. Just, just, that's always yeah, amazing. I mean, there, there's nothing in it that's toxic. You know, it, it has no heavy metals. It, it has no toxins. Now, the black stuff does. The black stuff, humic acid liquid. Don't ever drink that. It's got yeah, liquid. I'm not drinking the humic. Uh, humic I'm look. drinking the humic. No. <laughs> It's got nine parts, good, nine, ten parts per million lead. Oh, man, Not I couldn't imagine thing. taking a shot of full power. Uh, do but, uh, it. Take a shot of full power, uh, kid. Do you got to do, do it. it. It's sunlight. Yeah, part of your, it taste part of your initiation? It'll like, clear all your Taco Bell right that's, out. That's your initiation. Jump in. Does it taste terrible? <laughs> no, it has no flavor. That's full power jumping right Just there. Just water. Yeah, yeah. It makes me want to throw up. Yeah. It tastes like that. water, bud. It gets me sick even thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we, you know, we sell, uh, we have a whole other division that's just health products, and it's sold by almost worldwide. Now, can I mean, full power go Europe, bad? Australia, we we do have one. We do have one chat room question. Can full power go bad? Does it expire? Well, well, it doesn't expire. No, I mean, that, because it's already millions of right, years or right. thousands of years old. But that will, uh, it, it will oxidize. Right. And okay. heat. Now, I already mentioned the heat factor. Right. So you have to keep to keep it from from heat. Like if you put it in a car and it gets hot inside of a car or something gets really hot. Yeah. I could kill uh, it. I've done this on trips to South America when I take something with me. It's hot. It it gets uh, it smells like a swamp. It gets what I call swampy. Yeah. It gets swampy. Uh, mm -hmm. So. It, once you open it, it's going to get contaminated, and if it gets warm, it'll go swampy. And then you'll know it. And it, it, yeah. you'll get uh, algae growing around the water line. Yeah, it's pretty, just al algae. It's pretty it, easy those to plants, smell. Those plants, of course. You 
And that's what it. That's exactly what it smells like. The swampy smelling. I, it's compared to like swampy. if you ever have like a basement flooded and what like a, a flooded mm-hmm. carpet even smells like. That's it's very easy to spray yes. with your nose for sure. And yeah, that's right. It'll get swampy on you. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. But if it starts to get that way, it's it's starting to lose value because there's things happening uh, right. that are oxidizing yeah. and changing and, things. And now general so, oxidation is going to increase that value loss like if you leave it in sunlight or if you leave it open or you know whatever yeah so it's in a dark yeah, it's, main, it's mainly uh, dark dark is really the important dark and cool is important uh sunlight per se isn't going to hurt it except it's going to heat it up right actually it absorbs energy from the sun so, so, so energy. i got a i got but, a a little marketing idea for you. Why don't you oh, bottle it? Why don't you bottle it like wine, and then we can store it like in, a, in our little cellar cellars. And keep it there. In this little perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of folks do. I mean, a lot of folks uh, take this stuff every day. Really. Uh, the form, the uh, form we use for human consumption is processed like wine. Yeah, you, you said know, you it's called like making Lugin, equipment and all Lugin that. Lujan right? Wujin sand. No, Wujin yeah, sand. I put, I put your videos of the Wujin sand on our uh, Build a Soil blog because I found it really informative and it's you discussing the Wujin yeah. sand. So if anybody wants to check that out, he's got some good YouTube videos on it. Jeremy, would you mind cross posting those on our Adam Dunn show forum? Yeah, yeah, I will. Thanks, man. Uh, I just want to put uh, ask you gents to hold on one second. Please stay on the line. And Jeremy, if you could prepare to add uh, Steve Storch to the discussion after we do. Uh, about five minutes of shout-outs here, uh, then we will continue where we left off, if that's good with you guys. Okay, yeah, I'm good to do that. And so, basically, I'm just waiting, and I'm going to get Steve on right now, correct? Yeah, just uh, have Steve call in in about five minutes, okay. and then we'll... And you want Dr. Him. Faust to hang out? Yeah, Dr. Faust, please stay on the line. Okay, I'm standing by. Right on, cool. All right, very good. Of course, we want to give a big shout-out to way to grow our number one grow resource in Colorado. Adam, why don't you tell oh, yeah. us the correct number of way to grow store? It's seven. <laughs> seven. Seven. I was seven. correct. Yeah. yeah, you. but you said I was wrong or something. No, no, You no. said I was... He I did. said the he kid was wrong. wrong. Yeah. Adam's, said, Adam's been saying wrong. six. And I Adam's was, been I, saying I, that there's 19 <laughs> stores and there's only seven. No, no, no about these, that. Tell us, tell us, Adam. Anyway, the newest Go shop ahead. is in Silverthorne. So if you're up there in the mountains, you can get your gear without having to come all the way down, especially... During those crazy snowstorms, which last night we had a little snowstorm. Oh, much. Yep. wasn't much. wasn't much. I I was surprised. I like looked out the window and I was like, "Am I just, awake? Is yeah. this really like was, a huge snowflake?" Yesterday was, yesterday was, yes, and yesterday was shorts. Yesterday yeah. was shorts. But uh, seven locations and the one at uh, twelve fifty. Uh, or uh, sorry, our address duh. <laughs> at the uh, Platte 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 River. Platte. Yeah, at the Platte River location is the twenty thousand square foot largest one, and they also have concentrate uh corner there with it's awesome so you can pick up all your concentrate stuff a friend of mine picked up a cascade oven the other day so he was stoked didn't realize that he has to buy a pump now he has to go back and get a pump but at least you don't have to like order it on the internet wait etc 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 exactly exactly well uh, and of course incredibles edibles uh colorado's number one edibles boom if yeah. you're coming to cannabis cup i'm sure they'll be there so you got to check that have out you tried the gummies yet i haven't they're good. They're, if you like gummies, like I've been trying to find a good gummy candy. Often that gummies taste contain terrible. gelatin, so yeah, that's right. I, I can't, can't eat. eat I can't. Them. Can't. They're eat them. good though. They're good, but I mean, they, when it comes to their, you know, like I said, their Avocado Bar is still probably my favorite. I haven't one. even tried one. I gotta try. You one. gotta try one, man. It's the, the caramel. You can. It's not usual that they say like all oh, the drizzle, the I caramel. Did. You can taste the caramel in it. It's, it's good. nice. You can right. taste the caramel. It's really good. Of course. Hey, uh, Mitch. Adam. Yo. Just want to let you know I'm back, and I've got Stephen Storch on the line, so we can hang out. But I just want to let you know. Cool. Right on. <laughs> Roger, right on. Roger. Well, that's perfect because it's the, we got 15 seconds left to talk about Build the Soil. So. <laughs> oh, of course. Shout out to Build the Soil. <laughs> Jeremy Jeremy found his <laughs> slot <laughs> reading my timer impossibly via the, the <laughs> psychic mind waves because he drinks full of the gas. <laughs> that's my so, yeah. Buildthesoil.com <laughs> if you want in on this. If you want psychic abilities, Build the Soil. And, of course, shout out to Dark Horse Genetics, uh, the host of the Bruce Banner Bowl. Again, you guys are interested in the Breeders Only Seed Swap. You guys are interested in the pop-up seed bank. you got to come down. Adam, let him know when and where, what time. It's on April 18th at the Oriental Theater here in Denver. Kickoff to the cup itself. So Is there a place they can get pre-order tickets from, or do they just grab tickets at the door? Give them the uh, – it says it right there. It's Oriental it Theater's at website address. Oh, yeah, it says tickets are available at www.orientaltheater.com. Boom. Orientaltheater.com. Just search Murphy's Law, and, and you'll be good to go. There you go. Get in, come in. Seeds. I'm sure they're going to go quick, too. 
So yeah, they're gonna. Out. I mean, not only just is there it's everything just because of the pop up seats. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's it. I don't dude, know. Once you, whole place is done. Every it's time done. there's a cup event, it just goes quick. Yes. And when we're bringing together breeders and seeds, and add that to something to do after the first day of the cup. Also, want to do a quick shout out uh, for the big show coming this coming to town again, and it's going to be a, a very large one this year. So they have four different uh, arenas. I think they have a wow. a vapor uh, dedicated vapor only uh, thing going on. So all the different vape pens represented, and they're going to have uh, the Horticulture 360, which will be all grow stuff. So that's pretty cool, and we're going to have a booth there. So we're going to be nice. representing hard, doing a lot of interviews, and they also have the Galleria that they always do. Uh, which is glass from the top artists all over the country. And, I mean, amazing. They actually do such a good job of just getting them displayed and everything, too, properly. It's really so, nice, yeah. yeah. It's very nice. Like they it. actually bring some class. Bring us some class. Is around. that at the Expo Center, too? The same place as the exact Cup is, Exact right? same place. to keep yep. it all rolling and keep everything. So it's just the days before the Cup at the same yeah, place. Exactly. The days the cup. So it's wow. a build-up to the Cup. Yeah, they got nice. a lot of work to do to get that up and down. Nice. All right, well, on that note, let's uh, and bring... And everybody's over to AU uh, Extracts. Of course, AU, AU extracts. Of course. Yes. AU extracts. AU. 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 Like so that. where's that dab? Where's that AU dab? Yeah, you know I gotta. You know I gotta try some of that too. And on that note, just a little one, just a little taster. And on that note, let's bring back uh, Jeremy Silva from Build the Soil, who's presenting us now with uh, Steve Storch and of course Dr. Faust. And again, you can you can visit them at uh, uh, bioag.com is where Dr. Faust is, and he he's. Uh, the maker of Full Power, Cyto Plus, a bunch of other products. And then you can also go to buildasoil.com, and that's how you can get a hold of all of Jeremy's products and uh, essentially build a soil. And, Steve, we want to welcome welcome you to the conversation. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Glad to be here. I'm from under the uh, eastern tundra. <laughs> nice. Where are you based out of nowadays? You're, you're somewhere in, uh, like I feel like, the mid-Atlantic region. Is that right? Yeah, out on Long Island. Oh, you're out on Long Island. Okay. okay. Oh, well, yeah. Long Island. Oh, definitely not Middle Island. You're Northeast. <laughs> Here. Right on. So, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, and and uh, especially the biodynamic products that you're bringing to market. Okay. Well, uh, let me say, I was, I was educated in uh, marine biology, actually, and I spent like I don't know all my early years, you know, commercial fishing and going to college for marine bio and then I stayed out you know when I went to Southampton College I stayed out on the eastern end of the island here and I married into a farm family that happened to convert their old family farm to organic and biodynamic in the 70s but so by the early 80s it was pretty much all converted and that's kind of where I learned and practiced uh, what I do, and it's a, you know, it's a farm that's been in production since 1644, and you know, we're supplying a, a roadside store and three, four, five, five CSAs of like a you know, total of probably 600 members, and we're able to maintain you know soil fertility <laughs> with that kind of uh, commercial vegetable production. You know, grow 350 varieties of lettuces, tomatoes, squashes, herbs. I mean, you know, just everything. Some flowers, some fruit, berries, and and so, how much of biodynamics did you come? Did you get from that? And how much did you, you know, teach yourself and learn on your own? Hey, can we also um, just ask well, you to actually, turn I, down the feed I, on your computer? We're going to get some echo. Oh, yeah. If you're listening to it in the background, would you ask you to just turn down those, your speakers? And I just want to say I've come up with an awesome new segment for the bell, and I'm going to save it to the end because it's going to be the end of every I saw show. It. I saw it. But I have a great new – but I have a new – no, but that has nothing to do with it, but it's going to be great. just want to say be great. great. Give great. a guy from Philly a bell and you'll feel good. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey. You brought me this Liberty Bell. I was like, Yo. you're the fucking man. You brought me a Liberty Bell. Okay. Cool. I think he said he brought it for me, but whatever. He did, but you're not from Philly, so eat it. I'm pretty sure he said he brought it for the kid. Did he? No, he, didn't no it. he said he brought it for you. For the show. All right. For the show. So let's bring it back. Apologize for that. We got the background noise turned off. So. All right. Oh, no. It sounds like my yeah, stuff. I don't know. I, was, I had just gotten my tractor and I was in the moving we just moved the compost yard and i saw my brother-in-law was digging a hole with a friend of mine hugh williams who's an amazing biodynamic orchardist uh, upstate new york in the hudson valley 
And, you know, it was more that my brother-in-law was digging with a shovel that made me go over and look. And I went over, and they were burying some horns. And I just was like, you know, what are you doing? You know, my friend Q has been doing already by the Amos for probably 10 years. So I briefly explained it, and I said, really? So from there, I just I delved into it, and I tried it, and I saw the results, and it worked. And I just kept kept going with it, and that was probably... That was, that was 1989. So, I mean, but before then, when you first saw it, you must have thought, like, what's up with this hippie magic? This is some... Hippies. This well, is strange. you know, I mean, I was a trained, you know, marine biologist, so, you know, I don't know. I mean, I was more curious than uh, naysaying at first. I said, you know, these are two very practical people here. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, I said, well, let me, let me before, I, before I make any judgments like that, I'm just going to try it. And I did, and I saw things that yeah, I saw how it worked, kind of. And, and tell you the truth, it really took me finally probably ten years of doing it and seeing things and not seeing things before I finally like had a moment of like, wow, look at that. You know, there were some spots in the field. The land here is very flat, and you know there would be these holidays in the middle of the fields from big puddles. You know, mm. from these heavy early June rains. So, you know, before the farm, you know, the farm did go through a period of growing potatoes and, with all the chemicals, and, and it, so there was this rehabilitation period. But, you know, the soil went from having these puddles that would last for weeks after a, a two- or three-inch rain the wrong time of year, and, you know, the crops would die out and not grow there, to being... <coughs> And seeing that in the morning after heavy rain and then coming back later to you know, check on the cows, and the puddle is gone. So I went and I looked closer, and, you know, the I could see the earthworm activity which had all kinds of drain holes opened up all the way down through the subsoil. And there were probably, you know, that was by the mid-'90s, there was probably 600 pounds of earthworms per acre doing their work. And... It just was like, okay, so, you know, it's really, really works. And then, you know, once I could do that and I developed these other sprays and started working with the silica spray, like, you know, I could go in either a field or a landscape and, you know, you do one spray and the plants completely change their habit of the way they're holding their leaf and their posture. That's some of what you know, what impressed, I think, me when when I started using aloe and and silica and coconut, especially where you just see the plants with the leaves pointing upwards. They're really, they just look happy. They look like they're do they're and they look more like they're doing their job as antennae better. Right, they pick up instead of like hanging and drooping. They like get tur- you know have this turgidity and they stand up and like turn themselves towards the sun and lift. Actually, it actually enhances the levitational quality of the plant. That's nice. That's when that's when a happy plant. So it's always a happy plant. <laughs> and you know, and then I ended up having you know, I developed hydraulic stirring machines, and then you know, that was a hard sell. And I met Elaine Ingham in 1998, 99, and I was working at a vineyard, and she spoke to a bunch of vineyard people. So that's when I started working on, you know, the compost tea brewers. And, you know, I used to do all kinds of aquariums and underground filters and, you know, moving water with air and those kind of things. So, I, you know, that was what gave me the background and the impetus to develop the Vortex Brewer. And, um, you know, it's a way of just making biodynamics available to more people you know kind of demystifies it sure can you tell us about the vortex starting tool and here are the preps you can put in and just go so can you tell us more about the the vortex brewer and and how it works um Hey, I'm Why thinking we've also got Faust on the line, and I want to make sure he needs to be hanging out. I know it's time's back. Oh yeah, no, no, and he's 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 definitely welcome to please participate in any of these uh, and and share in this discussion. Hey, it sounds like they had similar backgrounds with uh, old family farms and seeing some real benefits to biodynamics. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's actually really interesting that it's kind of the in the case in both uh, for both. 
Yeah. Well, it's, it's a phenomenon of the East Coast, too. I mean, that's where the biodynamic association was. I saw my first biodynamic farm in Maine back in, like, 65 or something like that. Yeah, it, it's, it's something that was happening more on the East Coast. Yeah, I Maine, mean, not, not in Philly. Was in Maine. And you also vortex <laughs> your water, uh, Dr. Faust, uh, when you're making your humic and fulvic <laughs> products, correct? That's correct. Yeah, we have a, yeah. a vor- vortexing device, especially important in the human product. We, we, we vortex the human product. And that just gives it, uh, it, 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 matter of fact, that's work based on, uh, on, on an Austrian named Victor Schollenberg. And you, yeah, you and that's what it. turned... That's what turned me on to Stephen Storch. I had, you know, just started uh, growing, and obviously he's been doing this for much longer than I. And I looked to the leaders in the in the industry to find information, and I found my local shop started to use some of Storch's products and the Vortex Brewer, and I was really intrigued by the Vortexing. So, yeah, it, there's something to that. Again, you know, it seems like uh, fantasy or you know, woo woo, you know, kind of stuff. Just because we don't understand it. We don't totally understand it yet, you know. It's like, well, like, like I said, it's beyond us scientifically, and we can't take a single factor approach and analyze it, you know. And, no, you uh, can't. But if you look at, um, there's a if you look on YouTube and you put in helical model of the universe and watch, it's like two or three minutes long. Yeah, and it shows how the sun is going through space time, and basically, you know, the planets get dragged around behind the sun in its wake, and they're vortexing around the, the sun's orbit. See, so Saturn goes in 30 years. It takes Saturn 30 years to do one revolution around the sun. You know, the Earth does one a day. You know, the Mercury does a few a month, you know, they all have different rates. So when you look at it, all the planets are moving at different rates, and you can see, you know, the inner planets, Moon, Mercury, Venus, between the Sun and the Earth and the planets outside the Sun, you know, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter, and plus all the other big ones and and everything, and it's just all weaving and spinning and vortexing. And the resonance of our system makes everything grow up in a vortex. Water vortexes, the oceans through, you know, with the rotation and the production of and the mixing of warm and cold waters move in vortexual patterns. And, and I so, think the other you know, interesting thing is that plants in actually brewer, vortex. You plants that, grow in like a corkscrew. They don't grow in a straight line. Plant, well, DNA grow. grows in a vortex. I mean, well, sure, everything grows same. in like a <laughs> core. That's Not just if you go through the back scanner, it doesn't. No, then it's fucked. The de- yeah, basically cells, you know, cells are a vortex phenomenon. You have electrons rotating around a nucleus. See, <laughs> yep. So, yeah. and it's, it's not it's not flat of of everything, you know. And you know, in our production of full humic, I don't usually go into this because it just muddies the water. Yeah. You know? So I don't usually uh-huh. talk about vortexing, you know. But I know it improves the product. We we make our full humic in a vortex system. Okay, I mean it's it's pretty advanced stuff. Yeah, I have a. But I, it's I don't usually talk about it because why talk about it? Because it's, it's, it's yeah. you know the product speaks for itself. So no, but but we but, care about that, and that's why I'm glad you're sharing. Yeah, I have that's a, definitely yeah, sure. true. I have a uh, I have a uh, a, uh, a vortex built into the uh, ozone aqueous ozone generator that I have. So it runs it. So it runs. Uh, first, it runs it through ozone, and then it drops it into a vortex, and it's active for about four hours. And then after four hours, it just goes back into a water molecule. So, uh, you know, the same. So it's kind of definitely has def- <laughs> there's some definite magic built into the vortex, uh, for sure. And hey, uh, Storch, when did you start the Vortex Brewers? I'm curious about how long you've been doing that. Because I saw your boneyard of your prototypes on a photo one time, and it looked like you'd made a thousand of them. Yeah. Well, like I said, I started in 1998 was the first prototype I made. And then by um, 2001, I think, I, when I'd gone to Acres, I had, you know, built that uh, model out of a five-gallon water jug and I had the nice four-way manifold on the bottom. And that's that's the design that I put up on the uh, Subtle Energies 
Website. Yeah, that's the open information, the open source info that you've shared for a while, right? Yep, yep. Okay. And, um, you know, and then as I figured out different materials and tanks and stuff, they just always evolved. And, uh, you know, to what, it is, what we're doing now, and I can, you know, I could I build them with, you know, magnets in the manifolds and, I'm actually now is talking to a guy today so I can make a mold for the part on the bottom that really requires it's almost you know between the fittings it looks and like, cut it's is like, that like a golf ball dimple in. looking one What's yeah, that? that's a manifold piece that looks like it had dimples cut out Steering. oh yeah yeah I, I, I you know hand tooled that huh. with a Dremel and put put those like a golf ball surface on it to make the uh, the water go faster Interesting. And there were, that one that also had magnets embedded in it, in a, in a couple of different patterns. I did so, that on the in the center where the vortex goes in, and then where the where the return lines go back up. I put you know magnets and that dimpling in also. So yeah, you know, that just lets the water play more. You know, once you do that, like you know, if, if the flat the flat wall of a pipe creates a lot of friction they make you know they do that for golf balls so that when it goes sailing through the air that rippling lets the ball go faster interesting yeah so you know that lets the water go and play and then you know, you, your big brewer that you're talking about with the magnets is that a newer uh device that you're working on right now uh, i did i did one i did the first one last summer you know, I used to just take the magnets and stick them on the outside of the vortex body, and even I would tape them around on the outside of the manifold. But, you know, then I just, you know, so people didn't like, you know, the tape would wear off and the magnet would fall off, so I figured out a way to embed them into the PVC. I just drill some holes. And you buy, like, yeah, you get an eighth-inch drill and you get the little neodymium magnets. You can get eighth-inch by a sixteenth or an eighth inch stick by an eighth inch round, and you can just you drill the hole and you can just put them in the side. So I put a piece of you know a dab of silicone over it, and then you glue the pipe together, and it's hidden inside. Interesting. Yeah. Now, who's who's your main market? I know that you've talked to me in the past about uh, wineries using some of your vortex brewers. Obviously, uh, indoor growers using your your product. Uh, what yeah, would the benefit was, be? You know, I, I'm looking to water my soil, and I would get a vortex brewer to use your products to make a an active compost tea, right? Yeah, but it's also very energetic. You know, like okay. you know, the you're making the water more of a wetting agent by vortexing it, and you're imprinting it when it goes through the vortex with whatever products you're using. You know, see, that's the thing with biodynamics. If you're taking a biodynamic preparation, you have the 500. Or which is the manure, the horn manure, the horn silica, or the the compost preparations that go in the yeah. compost. Or you you you're only vortexing it for an hour, and then you're putting it on the field. Interesting. So you know, in one hour, you're going to grow some bacteria. You're not going to grow complex uh, fungi, on, and your high up protozoa or any algae is not going to appear in it in that short so the, of a time. Right. The benefits so, coming from the energy. It's well, they, it's it's in that compost, and then you're imprinting that, impressioning that onto the water, and then you're applying that to the field. You know, see when when the water molecule goes through the vortex, you know, see water is a dipole, so the hydrogen, H2O, it looks like a couple of Mickey Mouse ears on the oxygen, and it's generally I think about 62, 64 degrees, but when it goes through the vortex, those bond angles get stretched out. <laughs> to 102, hmm. See? and then it comes out and it snaps back and it's through that stretching and contraction period where it's, you know, what they call the memory of water is activated. See, so then it's kind of all the information in the compost, what it went through in the horn and the ground for the winter and being stimulated by the, you know, forces of Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter is, is what uh, stimulates root growth. Sounds like so we're training the water, basically. Yeah, you're entraining it with with those with that information, and and then so like you know if you look at our plants at the early in the season, and like you know believe me on the farm here we kind of beat the soil up, 
you know, we're we're doing production, and they haven't really got him into anything like no-till. It's very heavy rotation, and, you know, the soil's all plowed and disked, and then gone over with uh, those uh, Alice Chalmers G's with different weeding baskets and little cultivators to cut down on hand labor for weeding, and the soil gets beat up, but you use, we use these sprays, and the regeneration is incredible. Like, you pull up uh, a root after a few weeks after you're done cultivating, and, you know, the mycorrhizae in there is phenomenal. The depth of the root, you can mm-hmm. see, is just huge. You know, and the, the, root, the root mass is like 100 times more than, like, on a conventional farm. And, you know, the plants are getting all their nitrogen through the life-death cycle of the soil microbes. You know, the nitrogen comes from amino acids, proteins, yeah, and fats. And I, and I want to talk about so the source you, you're for... You're a microbe. You either die and your body goes back to the soil or you get eaten and then you get, you know, uh, defecated out as nitrogen. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. there's not a lot of choices for them. Yeah. And I, I did want to ask about the sources for your Progress Earth products. I, I've heard that they're really, really extremely high quality, and, and I know the results from using your products are extremely good. Uh, for people who don't know anything about biodynamics and are just kind of throwing them in a brewer and applying them like mm-hmm. any other compost tea. Yeah, no, I, I keep um, a few cows. I have my own Scottish Highlander cows. i got four of them that I keep just for the manure. And, you know, they, they generate in their loafing and feeding area probably 30 tons a year there with, the, you know, the bedding and the hay and the straw I put in. And, you know, that goes into the compost that uh, we, they call recharge. And then the compound is just the straight manure I pick that up off the field and bring that, and that gets mixed with, like, ground-up oyster shells and eggshells and local seaweeds, and I have some great local rock dust I get from some Rhode Island quarries, and I have some stuff from Montana, paramagnetic basalt. You know, so, I, you know, I, I've been grinding. I got a hammer mill for grinding, like, terracotta and shells, <laughs> bricks and things like that. So, you know, I putting all that stuff in there as a food source at the beginning of the cycle, which makes the, so that boom gets mixed. And I got different size pits, like some pits for like whole, will hold a ton of that stuff. And some pits are like three tons. And I just added one that's probably like six, six ton pit. So, you know, I, I <clears throat> just trying to kind of, I, I've never been outstripped my supply with the demand, but this spring I filled a lot of bags and sent them out. <laughs> and you know, it's it takes it takes uh, at least nine nine months to a year for me to look at that compost and say, okay, this is finished and ready to go. And how do yeah, you tell? Yeah, I was talking to you about your compost, and you have compost from years past. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I have. Let me see, I got. My 2012 pile is barely touched. 2013 is not touched. And I have 2011. It's pretty much just sitting there. And I got from the other piles from 2009 back to 2000. There's you know, a little bit of that. I, had, uh, I was getting compost food waste from the school, and I had them spraying the food waste as it went out of the kitchen with Pfeiffer compost starter. Mm-hmm. And that, if you've ever seen the Pfeiffer compost starter, what they do is they take the cow manure and they mix it, very complex recipe that's pretty well guarded. And, it, and then they do that for 30 days. And like they'll add like, a, they'll shoot a, add a groundhog to it and chop it up. And so, you know, in a month, 30 days of running this cement mixer, this stuff is like completely pasty, liquid, digested, and then they lay it out into cookies, and they dry it, and then they grind it. So it's like this really super fine powder. 
So you just take a little bit of that and you mix it in warm water for 12 hours and then you spray it on your compost. So they were doing that in the kitchen. And then after, you know, I, I had the pile there for a few years and the compost took on that powdery consistency. Mm -hmm. It's like totally different than the other compost because it's so powdery. Right, very completely. And when I'm digging in it, I can see, oh, that's the compost from the raw school and... 2000 and so it's pretty wild what are you looking for when you're saying the compost is ready to go out are you looking for any special consistency or or color or smell no, or? i want to pick it up and squeeze it between my fingers and if there's anything like a twig or a piece of straw or a leaf it just is just going to break up and look like humus and then you know when you put it in your hands and you squeeze it and you rub your hands it should be nothing sticking to your hands Interesting. And that's pretty much the cheapest like, compost test like in the world. It's like baking a cake. Yeah. Don't, don't let it stick. And then, Nothing sticks you know, you because I'll tell you, people, these big companies that are taking, like, municipal leaf, leaf waste and they're turning it and turning it and turning it, mm -hmm. they're basically, they're not composting it. That's oxidized. And that compost is usually acidic. It's... Um, only has a few bacteria in it. There's never a chance for any fungi to grow. And when they turn it, they're spiking the temperature, they're filling it with air, which is good for oxidation, but they're oxidizing it. You know, they, they don't give it an opportunity to develop any communities of protozoa, you know, your micro and macro arthropods, which are like going to be able to crawl and walk around your pile and go all through there and let the air in and the water in and let the compost breathe. And, you know, that kind of compost is, you know, you can get stuff like that, get 20 tons of it, let it sit in your back of your yard, put in one 30-pound bag of my compost, just sprinkle it over the top or put, you know, put it in a tea and spray it down and then cover the pile either with a tarp or a couple of bales of straw and let it sit for a either six months or a year, and you would not believe what it turns into because it's a beautiful media. Right, it's but, a good starter, you know, but it's not a finished product. Not a, Well, it's, it's, to them it's finished because it's not heating up anymore, but they're yeah. not looking at the kind of quality that a farmer really wants for you know, building up his, his unit. And like if you were to if you were to try and make a humic acid extract from something like that, it would be very very low quality. And so if you just make a compost tea from that, for example, which I think many people do, they buy the bag store bought compost, and uh, they just go ahead and try to make a compost tea out of it. That's not the same thing. No, it's not. That's why that's why people do that, and they say, "Oh, this stuff is it's not that good." Because your compost tea is only as good as your compost is. And I think, Dr. Faust, that echoes kind of what you've been saying about humix and fulvix, where, where sort of at some point a lower quality product gets released, people sort of jump on the bandwagon, <laughs> try it, they don't get good results, and they, and they think ill of the whole thing. Oh, I guess we lost him. What happened? No. No, Dr. Faust? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I know right. we were just comparing how the uh, comparing similar thing with compost. You know, you get a bad compost and make a tea from it. It's not going to work for it very well. Same thing with humic acid. You get a company making a low-grade product, and it can kind of derail the progress that uh, people that understand the results are and, seeing. And, and a lot of companies that, that take the approach of making a low-grade product are companies that also take the approach of marketing aggressively to compensate for, yes. for the lack of word oh, yeah. of mouth. Yeah. And I think that, that well, what happens is it gets yeah. the whole thing a bad name. Yeah, and they, and they well, also that's go what, in That's the, what happens in the health product of conversion of humic substances, too. I mean, there's people that they don't know how to get the heavy metals out. They, they will extract something from a hillside down in Utah, and it's got a little bit of humic substances in it, but it's also got mercury, cadmium, lead, aluminum. Jeez. You know, it's actually hazardous waste. And so they turn yeah. that around and say... Oh, well, but ours has got 74 minerals in it. You see, so that's what my grandfather used to call making a silk purse out of a sow's ear. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, in other words, they don't know how to they don't know how to make a pure product. So let's let's hype the bad stuff that's in it. You know, as as something beneficial. Yeah. And it, but but yeah, the, the, there's a cycle with these products. Uh, they hype them, they push them hard, they use a lot of marketing. The results are disappointing. Mm-hmm. And then, right. then the whole concept goes out the window. So that's what I've, I've been steady in this thing for 45 years. And, and uh, that's uh, basically what our products are, are consistent. The idea is consistent. It's the real deal. <laughs> yep. If you want and, to And that's stuff, really what it takes. Get what, takes yeah. You know, it takes persistence and consistency. Because, you know, like if so many people came out with sea mineral products, and it's taken probably, I don't know, this is easily 10 years, and we have, I've got people coming back around now, they've, they've tried everything, they've tried, and, and you know how growers are, I mean, you guys, you know, you stuff, you're trialing it, you're looking, you're watching your plants, and you know what, you put, you, you, you give them the good stuff, and the, a good grower is going to notice it, and they're going to come back. Yep, no, it's true, and that's the secret. I don't do any advertising as well, other than working with the Adam Dunn Show, because I, I love the message that they're putting out, and I love these community conversations we can have, because for too long, this information was secret, and so all of us were very easily taken advantage of by some of the marketing. Now we can talk about it, ask these questions, learn more, and it's you know it's exciting to me. I want to make better soil for our customers. I want to get better results, and so... I'm looking into making a biodynamic compost locally, and I want to talk to Steve about his products to make that happen. And the more we can all work together, I think just the more exciting it is because we keep out that hype, fast buck mentality, and then the farmers really notice the results of the products. And Steve, yeah, I wanted I to ask more I about love... your, your sea minerals, uh, why they work so well. What What is it about sea minerals? Because... Would that traditionally get into? Pl- I guess it would traditionally get into soil through kelp and through fish. Yeah, not even. I mean, this the what you're getting from kelp and fish. You know, kelp. Yeah, it's in it's in the sea, and it it's never you never see a blemish on kelp. Right. Like you know, when I was commercial fishing, I don't know how many fish I've killed and cut open and filleted and gilled and gutted and that kind of thing, but it's been a lot. A lot, and you never see in a saltwater fish any imperfection in their liver. You know, I mean, if the, if the water is polluted, there'll be a lesion on their skin. Right. That's about it. You never see an internal deficiency in a in a in a saltwater uh, fish. So, you know, so that's what you're getting in the in the fish emulsions and. You know the seaweed extracts or emulsions, however they do it, if it's dried. But you know the seawater has got everything on Earth is dissolved in the sea. There's like 90, 85 to 95 minerals and different sea salts. So what I do is I go offshore in my spot about 20 miles off, and I bring back about a thousand gallons, and then I supersaturate that with Himalayan salt. For text for weeks, you know, because that if I have a, I, I boost that up to about fifteen hundred gallons. So I add like you know five hundred gallons of some good water, and then I just keep adding uh, Himalayan salt to super saturate it to get it. So to get it to twenty six percent, I got to add about two pounds of salt per gallon. And then while that's happening and it's running through the vortex, I put in all my different compost and the preps in it. And and again, it's maybe it's the vortexing that does it. And I can only do like these fifteen hundred gallon batches right now. I have a two thousand gallon tank that's not set up, but I haven't you know haven't really sold out, so it's not really an issue. But you know, so that product just has all that information in it, right? And you know that gets diluted anywhere from two hundred parts of water to one part of the tonic down to, you know, 600 parts. You know, 175 to 1 will give you 2,000 parts per million. You know, 350 to 1 will give you 1,000 parts per million. You know, 700 to 1 will give you 500 parts per million. 
So you can do really light foliars with it. And it's great because, you know, that's OMRI approved and it's unrestricted. So that can be applied every week to wheatgrass or lettuce and tomatoes and whatever it is. You can just apply it constantly in very low doses. <laughs> and if you use it in the morning, it's got a silica effect. If you spray it before noon, you can spray it after 3 for a for a uh, root building effect with the 500. So, all those things so instead there. of just getting a salt water type of product out there, you can actually get your product, the tonic, and it's going to have biodynamic preps as well as fresh ocean water as well as the Himalayan salt. Yes. So yeah. I have some, and I use really small amounts. My concern when I hear salt water and my customer's concern is salt. You know, you want to avoid salt. Right, so we're I guess scared of salt. So I guess it's a really low parts per million, right, that doesn't have a negative effect there. It doesn't have a negative effect, and, you know, sodium is a required nutrient. It is. And if you, is. I mean, if you look at sodium and chlorine, they're both very reactive. You know, if you don't remember sodium, when I was in school, they used to have it in a jar of oil, a chunk of sodium, which is a very soft metal, and they would take a pair of forceps and pinch a piece off and rinse it under water to get the oil off of it, and the thing would spontaneously combust to a very white, bright light. Huh. Kind of like burns almost as bright as magnesium. Right. Okay. And then chlorine, you know chlorine, it's very volatile. It's, it's a poisonous halogen. gas, yeah. So, you know, these two things are, are required for, you know, and, and it's on in my soil test. It's like sodium, sometimes sodium comes in low. Yep. Sometimes you know, it's so, low, and, and you can use more salt products. You can use more kelp and stuff without worry about it. Sometimes we'll see the salt coming in high, and we want to just think about that. But mm -hmm. it's good to know. There's also chlorine on the soil test, and people think, oh, no, it's, I'm going to have chlorine in my water, but it's slightly different when we're talking about a soil test. So Right. And, uh, well, what we need to consider, you know, when well, you're talking about the western U.S., uh, yep. where, I, where most of my career has been spent, it's a really big problem with sodium. So when we hear... Anything well, with yeah. uh, so that's going to be in Colorado. That's going to be Idaho. That's going to be California. That's going to be uh, the problem that I used to correct with humic humic acids. I used to do reclamation of lands in Texas, right. Nevada. You know, so so in the Western context, it's it's more of a problem than in a humid, you know, high rainfall area where where it can actually benefit plant growth, but. From from uh, in Colorado, you got more of a salt problem uh, in the western U.S. It's quite serious. Yeah. And, so we uh, have got calcium. Look, you also have to understand that most all of the fertilizers, any NPK you buy, is bound in sodium chloride. Yeah. The problem is once you once you disrupt your soil, like and you're using those products, yeah, you're going to get sodium buildup. If you if you don't have good CEC and good biology, you know, cation exchange capacity in your soil, and you don't have good biology if you don't see any kind of crumb structure, if there's not, if you just have bacterial soil, that's weedy, it's got no structure, it's got no air in it, and yeah, you're going to build up those problems, and you have compaction of that, you know, running those big fields with the, with the equipment they use. You know, if, uh, I don't know, like these cow organic, you know, you got you got a thousand acres of lettuce. I'm sure it's everything is mechanized. Maybe it's five thousand acres. <clears throat> You're going over that with equipment and and you know, the metal implements metal the, the iron that builds up in the soil from the implements degrades the wo soil's water holding capacity. See, that's why during the Bronze Age agriculture hit big high note because, you know, the copper and the bronze being dragged to the soil didn't destroy the charge in the soil and it let the soil hold water better. That's interesting. You're nodding a lot like, yeah. you, like you're, you've been thinking this, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> thinking it all along. Like, well, it's ah, it's the whole electrical charge thing. Well, also yeah, we were yeah, doing that with the little test runs. We were doing with electrical charging on the, on the root zone and it was like, hmm, something going on here. There's definitely something going on there. Keep going. Yes. Yes. And, <laughs> yes. 
and, and you know, and it's a lot, you know, because you know the mechanization makes things real easy. I mean, you know, one one guy can you know farm fifty thousand acres of corn or wheat, with a couple, of, you know, big machine. I mean, you get a forty fifty foot wide harrow and then a planter behind it, and you go. But you know, there's a price to pay on the soil when you're using that technique of soil cultivation, and then those you know amendments that you're using all drain that capacity from, from the soil. Good. Everybody's in silence mode. Silence mode. Yeah, we're just listening. You, you can <laughs> keep talking. Listening, yeah. And um, well, and and like you said, you make you know, and, and that's why I think that my mycelial product works because it's got the humic component in it. And I know that, like when I first was doing that, I think it was you know one company, Ocean Grown, who were the guys who took over Maynard Murray's, you know, production. You know, they they went to copy me, and uh, right away they had a salt, you know, their seawater product with a humic acid. But again, they weren't they were buying a humic acid and adding it to their thing. So how good was the product that they were adding to their yeah? Minerals. Right. It could have been a cheap humic product, and we just talked about that for a while. Right. You know, so, you know, you're, and you know, like all of this stuff, I love telling people what I do. I don't have really any secrets. And you know what? If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. You don't have to buy it from me. Because, yeah. you know, you know, people with big farms and stuff, I totally understand the economy. Because that's where I, you know, that's where my stuff came out of. You know, this is a commercial vegetable operation. It's really, a, you know, a serious business here. And I understand growers, eco- you know, economics, and it has to it has to pay, it has to make sense. So, you know, if somebody hears what I'm saying and they want to try it themselves, please do it. You know, yeah, if but people if, buy if it they want to borrow from your 30 years of experience, they can do that too, and it might save them some time. Well, right, and I always encourage people, look, you're doing this, you think this is, if you think the inoculum is expensive, this is how I make it. Go do a few batches yourself. Right. Yeah. It is. There's a lot of work into your inoculants, and it took me a couple years to really see the value in your products. And it was partially because there wasn't a lot of hype advertising. It was a simple brown bag with compost, and I thought, wow, that's expensive. And now I know how you make it, and I'm like, (laughs) Wow, that's pretty affordable. I I don't have time to make that. <laughs> yeah. And you you know, at a third of a cup per acre, you know, it goes a long way. Yeah, that's wild. A third uh, of a cup per acre. Imagine yeah. that you could do the whole farm with a bag. Yeah, yeah. we'll be talking, uh, Steve, about uh, getting. I know we already talked about sending some compost out this way, but. I definitely want to ask you a few more questions when we get off the phone a little later. So. And, Jeremy, okay. that means you and I will be talking because I would love to get my hands yeah. on some of that compost if I it's know. coming this side. We've been talking about all that stuff. So uh, it, it's good things that happen when we all connect. I love it. Yeah. So, so we got about 15 minutes left in, in this segment here, uh, and then we're going to okay. get to our wrap-up. But uh, So first we want to, Steve and, and also Dr. Faust, we want to thank you guys for coming on and, and schooling everyone on some of these more advanced organic subjects because I think – at some point, we, we can all read the articles and we all know which dynamic accumulators we're using and, and that we want to use fulvic acid and things like this, but the whys and the hows are become the, the real questions at some point. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah thank we want to specify, too. Way. There's so many products, and we, and we always question, do I need to keep buying this? Is this really doing anything? And <laughs> without doing a, a year-long test on every product, it's really nice to be able to pull from science and pull from leaders that have done this for decades, you know? Mm-hmm. Nice. Well, thank you. So if, thank anybody, you guys. if anybody's interested, this is Dr. Faust here. If anybody's interested, I'm willing to do all day seminars, you know, if somebody can organize it. And well, we can okay. get down to the, the real nitty gritty of a lot of things. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll definitely take that challenge on if yeah, we can, we can if we can happen. do it via the internet. Yep. Uh, and then we can get <laughs> viewers and listeners from all over and we'll have it recorded for posterity's sake. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, you up. bet. That's a piece I'm working of on establishing the hemp industry here in Oregon, you know, and that's a whole Perfect. other area of discussion. And, yeah, I'd love uh, to talk I more see. about that. A lot of Colorado hemp growers have a lot of questions right now. Adam, yeah, I, 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 that's another whole show we need to do for sure. Yeah. So, um, with the 15 minutes we have left, guys, uh, 
let's talk about what you think are the, the most the basic tips that anyone can take away uh, and apply from this, whether you're growing and knowing, making your own compost and, and, you know, making your own soil or whether you're just, I don't know, started growing last week. I, you know, I would have to say, if, if I can go first, I would say that, you know, the thing that jumped out, jumps off the page at me from studying biodynamics and Steiner and Victor Schauberg and these people and is that, you know, conventional agriculture and even organic agriculture, basically everything you're addressing with your fertility is geared toward the root and geared toward the soil. And what I love about biodynamics is how it talks about how you have the soil is your lime calcium polarity and the, you know, stem, leaf, flower and fruit and seed formation is the upper part of the plant is, a, is the silica polarity. Mm. And, you know, a real easy way that it came to me to think about that is, you know, concrete, cement is lime, calcium. You know, they slake it with fire and heat it and get it into, the, into that form. And then they mix it with silica. <laughs> and those two things stick together and make concrete. Huh. So, you know, the... I'm like sitting here in my house looking out the window at this tree. You know, the, the root is the earthly part that's in the ground. It's like the brain of the plant that goes out and connects with the soil and tells it, you know, brings in the food. And the upper part of the plant is, you know, your reproductive, your rhythmic breathing, digestion part. And, you know, to have a tool to go out and spray silica in the atmosphere around your plants and farm totally locks those two things into step and brings balance and lets you build health. So disease is not a problem. Like everyone always asks about disease. I said, look, I'm really not worried about it. I want to build such a level of health in the soil that whatever little bit of disease I get doesn't matter. I can't worry about every little thing that pokes its head out, you know? For sure. Absolutely. And then to me, that's like an awesome tool. When I realized how to use silica to activate, you know, the plants, it really changed everything. Yeah, silica is great. But just uh, on that subject of silica, the silicic acid, which I've been highly, deeply involved with uh, since my days in Hawaii, but research done, you know, for instance, in Florida on the citrus industry by Dr. Matichenkov, who is a the head of the International Silicon Society, okay, mm -hmm. they hired him to find out what was wrong with citrus, okay, and what what was wrong with citrus applies to what's wrong with just about every crop, okay? So the main limiting factors, we've got three limiting factors in any given field, and the, the two important ones are humic substances and monosilicic acid. So they are the two... Uh, limiting factors uh, for yield or quality in any given field. And the other one is the compaction, soil compaction. Yeah. But the, the, the crucial factors that, that, that uh, let's say civilizations go down, economies go down based on depletion of silica and humic substances. They, they go together. Uh, and, yep. and once these things go away, you know, the soil gets hard, the nutrient availability is lost, uh, nutrition is, is compromised. Like when we see the corn growers, the mound builders of, of the Midwestern U.S., Ohio, like Moundsville, this is a civilization that existed here before, you know, uh, Europeans arrived. Uh, when we see the the buried remains of these people at the beginning of this, their civilization, they were healthy. At the end, you know, their teeth de degenerated, their bones, they just fell apart. And basically, it's that whole cycle of, uh, of cropping, oxidation, loss of silica availability mm. of, in the form of silicic acid, which is crucially right. related to humic substances. So this all fits together. And uh, we can go into a new area and cut down a, a forest, and we're good for a while. But then everybody yep. just keeps moving west. So that that's the that's what's going on in the whole world, and why we're seeing you know what we're seeing today is is just this general depletion. You know, 
of these factors, which we know what they are. <laughs> but try right. to uh, you know try to try to get that point across. It's and not it, easy because it's not practical. It sounds you know, like it's relatively thinking, easy. I mean, industrial to, model. It sounds like it's relatively mm-hmm. easy to to remediate it though with pretty 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 easy practices and on and on. Not even demanding a large amount. That's true. That's true. Uh, we found that well, this goes back to John Hamaker, who predicted the, the climate change we're seeing now. He wrote a book called The Survival of Civilization back in the 70s. It was popular in Acres USA. But, you know, it's based on cycles of history based on demineralization. Well, we know that that's true. And, uh, and it affects economies, it affects people's health, mental well-being, everything. And so everything starts to unravel, you know, and we're seeing right. that now. And the, the, the oceans acidify, for instance. Uh, you know, now we have radioactivity, radioisotopes floating around, you know. And we've really uh, done some incredibly destructive factors, but... That's what life on Earth is based on, is the health of the soil. And that's why civilizations progress. That's why, you know, this country was initially successful. You know, now we're just living on, uh, we're just living on salt fertilizers and fossil fuels at this point. Uh, right. But normally a civilization would have failed a long time ago if we hadn't, you know, if it weren't for chemical fertilizers which allow sort of an artificial production of fairly unhealthy foods, you know, uh, right. which is one reason I like to go down to the uh, Amazon and down to the, the Andes and, you know, and, and, and see what uh, farmers, uh, traditional farmers are doing. And, and it's, it's mm-hmm. something like that, you know, that, that I learned from. I mean, who is sustainable? We want to learn sustainability. What what is sustainable? Well, what's an example of sustainable? You know, how many years or centuries does that require to be called sustainable? But you know, right. I can get off on a tangent. But the point is, <laughs> humic substances and monosilicic acid. And if you can't figure that one out, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a it's it's a dead end street. You know, it's it's. Uh, and of course, steel flag is one of the best sources of silica. Cheap, inexpensive. Uh, and there's there's other sources like volcanic uh, uh, lava. Some of the best. Is what well, any of the, the any of the basalt. Yeah, the basalt. Uh, and then a product right. we're getting out of Montana right now. It's uh, uh, 75%. Yeah, I was looking at that Montana product, and uh, uh, we also add rice rice holes to the soil, and that breaks down into what I assume would be oh, silicic yeah. acid at some point. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. The Japanese, uh, that's where I got most of my information when I got into this whole silicic acid subject, was Shell 13, which is a product that uh, cannabis growers in Hawaii were using. Uh, it was a Japanese product, and it's the first time I ever heard the word silicic acid. But... Mm. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's a fossil shell product. Uh, well, uh, but, dan- uh, dandelion is full of silicic acid. Yeah, you yeah, go back and, uh, to biodynamics. You're you're talking about horse tail. Horse tail you're as talking well, yeah. about what they call biodynamic plants, which yeah. You know, uh, our product Ion 14 is a version of that. It's humic substances, activated humic substances, and monosilicic acid. That's what we call ion-14. Uh, uh, ion-14 is silica. It's, it's the 14th element. So, right. so <laughs> nice. that product is designed to, 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 to deal with those limiting factors that, that are the most common limiting factors in any given agricultural soil. And so Stephen Storch, what, what, what product do you have? I, I'm guessing it's your compost as well as your tonic that would provide the silica. Oh yeah, the, the the tonic is got it's loaded with silica, and like a, okay. you potentize that or make, you mix that in the morning and spray it before noon, you're going to get more of a, the silica effect. And for the 500 or composting effect, you spray it after three. So okay. Just by that morning or evening gesture, 
cool. Well, I know I'm going to be looking more into that, and I'm also going to look at this Ion 14 and just research some things that I haven't really talked about at Build a Soil before, and I'm excited. So, Wonderful. Well, we've got five minutes left in the segment. And, uh, again, I want to thank you guys again for coming on and, and teaching us all something. Like, everyone here is like, wow, I'm really learning this episode, just sitting here pretty quiet. Yeah. And it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, silica being – a crystal that has a lot to do with conducting energy in both the soil and plant. It has it exhibits piezoelectric qualities, um, and adding that to these minerals that are metal. That's like wires and stuff. Yeah, I feel like that all kind of makes sense. That that energy can move through this. Now we have Doctor Mark in the room, though. Who's my my skeptic? Is he on the mic, Ryan? Is that mic? No, that's unfortunate. <laughs> But I'm sure Dr. Mark could explain it more more scientifically than all that. But uh, sort of sort of makes you know the whole living biomatrix thing pretty pretty close. I can tell you that uh, coming from the chemistry side of things, everything that they're saying is spot on correct. That's great. There we go. That's is that's over. Doctor, is wait, did everything I just said spot on correct too no, about how? Yeah, well, not totally everything weird. I said about made up stuff. about <laughs> Earth being a Earth computer. Wires. I know that's, that's obvious. You like that, right? Yeah, but that's that's obvious. Too some, obvious. Smoke some DMT, you'll be like, "Yep, yeah, it's Duh. all wires." Duh. Obviously, geez. Yeah. <laughs> but um, are there ways that people can, you know, make this? Well, first of all, how can people get your products if they don't have a grocery store near them? Obvi- uh, right now, we can get the build the soil stuff from build the soil, and hopefully, Jeremy will carry it all in the near future. Yeah, but, and I've got a lot of bioag products there just because I've been slowly adding them and you'll notice I don't carry products I don't use and so as I've used bioag products I add them on we will eventually be carrying all of them just because I believe in the, uh, in the products and you know when we get off the phone today I'm going to talk to Steve about some of the Progress Earth stuff because it's another company I, I believe in and I think we should be supported and in the meantime uh, where are those available online uh, Steve where's your website you, you can get all the stuff at vortexbrewer.com perfect there you go, vortexbrewer.com. Yeah. And the bio yeah, eggs? And the bio egg products are, are available from uh, usually just about every grow shop in, in the country. Yep. Uh, mostly the I Western used to US. Ask, ask them to order it in, and they'd get it in in a couple of days because their distributor had it, even if they didn't carry it. So. Yeah, we're distributed by Worms Way and, uh, and Sunlight Supply. And so uh, people sell it online, you know, so. It's available. Yeah, go to our website. Has yeah. the names of the dealers. Bioag.com. Yeah, and if you're uh, somebody out there that's looking to use this uh, full of product on an agricultural level, you can contact me, and I've got some uh, information that we can talk about about larger scale. So. That that's awesome. So we do have six minutes left. Uh, six minutes. Do you have questions, kid? How do we go for five minutes? I guess it wasn't five minutes. I'm looking at the clock now. That's just six minutes. You mean six minutes from the total total time? No, we got six minutes to this segment, it tells me. We got six minutes left in the show. Oh, all right. Well, in that case, we do have six minutes left. We thought we were in a vortex. We do have to thank you, Jess. You should definitely post that PDF that I texted you. I did. I already posted it. It's a very informative PDF on both humic and fulvic acid. So if you're looking at, if you go to adamdunshow.com, guys, and you look to the right of the video box you'll see the forum and then it says resources on humix and fulvix it's cut off but it says fulvix has six views you, it could have more while you guys are clicking on things on adamdunshow.com or on livestream.com please kick, click on the facebook like button directly above the video box uh we want to thank you again jeremy silva from build the soil steve search from progress earth and vortex brewer and of course dr faust from bioag for coming on the show and teaching everyone so much that they're going to have to listen to this a few times to kind of even absorb it all. Great. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Let's guys. definitely do it again. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> thank you. Aloha. 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 Right on. Five minutes. Should have brought him on the uh, Hawaiian show. I know. That's Come okay. on. We'll now do we a redux. We'll do Hawaii redux. Now All we... the episodes are converging because the Earth's a computer, Adam. It is. Well, we know that. I told you we know that. Wait, hi, do you want to know a new segment I came up with? Yes. Oh, is this what we're using our phone? Well, no, we, because pe- I found out that people like giveaways. And even if so, I, I figured. You like, found out? Did that you figure people, this out? Where, no, where, you get where did you discover this? Uh, obvious. Where did you find this out, Ryan? I, I don't even know. obvious. I don't have to find uh, it. Callers, you want to call in? No, hold on. Start, no. Stop. 
That's no. What we're going to do. We're no. going to ask one question about something that happened on the show today yeah. at the end of every show. And yeah. after four shows, so after a month, you have to call in with the answer to all four questions. Oh, this is our and then we'll give lost. one I'm lost. I'm lost. No, it's simple. This is like one of those games when you're a you kid get, and you're like, you, you make it up no, so you, you listen to win. the show four <laughs> weeks in a row. <laughs> you write down the answer to the question at the end of the show. Okay. And on the fourth week. And you submit all of them. Week, you, you submit them all. all. You call in. You'll submit all the answers. So that way we only have one winner. One person to ship something to, and that way we can make sure because <laughs> we can't that we handle get it multiple done. anything's obviously. Yeah. So you have to listen four weeks in a row, answer okay. four questions correctly. We'll choose one of the answers of the four correct questions. Who will win what? It'll win some, something, maybe a pack of seeds. It could be a T-shirt. Oh, yeah. It could be anything. We'll, we'll figure it out. Something. You're gonna we'll, come up with the pa- with the, we'll, with we'll the prize. Something out. Uh, the, the, the prize play. will change all the time. It's not going to be the same prize all the time. Okay, so so Adam what's Adam. this week's question? So, Adam, you have to pick a number between one and four. What? what? You have to pick a number between one and four. You get the, it's going to be random selection. Oh, man. And it's just a question about it, just to see if you listen through the and whole show. That's so what, I it. say one, and then you just like. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you say one, and I have them picked up here. Right. You're going to let me know. All right. It's pretty, it's just one to four, it's tough. How do we, how do we do that? Just pick a number, dude. What's the problem? <laughs> three. Okay. I was thinking three, too. Um, let's see. <laughs> Which one of these products is safe to drink? Is it the fulvic acid or the humic acids? Which one of those can you safely question. drink? Good question. Good question. And not get sick from. Don't it? call in so with don't it now. Don't call in now. Write oh, it down. And I can't tell you the answer. Make a mental oh, I note. I know it. I know it. And and uh, see, there's already people calling right now. Oh, pick, it pick, pick it up. Pick it up. Tell them because now somebody will shout out the answer. So don't call. No. Write it down. Save it until so the next one, the first one we'll give away will be on April 22nd. So that's a month from now. So It'll be all the after answers. everything's given away. Yeah, we'll have so much stuff to give away. Though. Yeah, we'll That's have perfect. all the free T-shirts. From the go. <laughs> That's perfect because you can't just tune in at the end of the show. No, we'll give you all show. our swag. How's that? I, I get a lot of swag. I get a lot of swag too. And we'll give you. But it'll you can change have every week. My we'll seconds. You, you can have my price. sloppy seconds. <laughs> right on. Uh, shouts. Shouts. We got a couple minutes left. You guys want to do that? One, one question. Uh, oh, that was it? That was it? So that's it. So they write down that question, Bam. and then next week there'll be a different question oh, about man. the show. I thought it was four questions every week. No, that's three too much, man. With no. a complicated. It's going to be four answers. I wanted to make it real complicated. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm pretty hungry, too. It, it's too bad. The, uh, the ba- I, went, oh, I went to the bagel spot yesterday. It was awesome. It was like the best place ever. I was like, why haven't I been here before? Oh, yeah. You want to go there? It's closed. Is it? Mad people no. call in. Hey, mad people calling in because they don't get the because st- your thing five. is too com- too complicated. I'm telling you, you're gonna get the you're not gonna win the contest if you can't if follow. You, the rules. If you can't, if follow, you can't follow it, can't no, no, don't rules, call rules. in now. Don't tell can us. Can we post the questions in the forum? Yes, yes. we can post the questions. Post and again, questions. And this week's question is rules. which one is safe to drink? Yes, fulvic acid or humic acid. There you go. Just write it down. Save it until April 26th. Oh, just try it. Actually, it's better. Okay, this number keeps calling. It's an easy one. Pick it up. Just pick what up. What are you about? Okay, you're on the Adam Dunn Show. Who's this? Hey, this is Andrew. Hey, Andrew. What's going on, man? Hey, not much, man. I just had a, a really quick question. Um, I was wondering if you could convert. Uh, we're using our soil, and I was just wondering if you can, in uh, using synthetics, uh, I was just wondering if you could compost that or somehow recycle that to get everything out. So... The theoretical answer is, at some point, yes. The real answer is, uh, let me ask Dr. Mark. Dr. Mark, yes. can you come on the microphone here? Yes, if sir. you're using uh, synthetic nutrient salts in your soil as a fertilizer, could you break these down through comp- inorganic things? Uh, be, can they be broken down through composting and such? So it depends what the salt is. I mean, you can't um, uh, really understand uh, what you're talking about, and not all salts are created equal. Um, so gotcha. um, most salts will will dissolve in water, but some salts have uh, metal cations like calcium, like calcium sulfate, which is rather insoluble. So it really depends what what are the minerals you're talking about. You can't just universally say that it's going to be. Do you have a brand? Do you have a br- Do you have a certain brand that you're uh, using? General hydroponics. General hydroponics. Can you can you can you General theorize on their on their their quality of uh, products to uh, all in like twenty five seconds? All I could say in, in <laughs> broad general strokes is usually you need some crazy fungal stuff to break down all sorts of metals and things like that. Fungal love metals. Though. They like they like all yes, these hydrocarbons absolutely. too. So, so metals. I think uh, the gentleman required or, or uh, spoke of this earlier. Metals are required for nitrogen fixation, which is absolutely essential for. 
amino acid and protein synthesis within the plant. So it's absolutely essential to have minerals that essentially uh, bind to molecular nitrogen, which is pretty inert, but when it binds to these metals in these metalloenzymes, they're able to basically break down molecular nitrogen, which is typically very inert, to, to amine compounds, and these amine compounds become amino acids and ultimately proteins and enzymes that, that do all the cannabinoid biosynthesis in a plant. Bam, there's your answer. Boom, thanks for calling in, man. Thanks we'll for calling. Yeah, we'll thanks, talk man. to you soon. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and, so, I hope uh, that answer is good enough for that guy. That was a, calling in. That was was a, a good, good answer. Question, that was a that good, was a good answer. answer. Good so. answer. So, we're on to the final uh, shout outs. Shout I think. outs, yep. shout outs. Bam. Uh, we're even going to cue intro music behind shout outs. So, no, let's do it. No, no one no, likes yeah. intro music behind shout outs. It no, confuses us. The kid, do your shout outs first. Shout outs to the change. Shout outs to Brit. Shout outs to the dog. Shout outs to the club. The kid's done. Shout outs to Oh, yeah. That's it. Kids are done. I guess I am done, though. That's Cool. That's that it. works. Yeah. Sweet. And, and Dixie. Woo. Yep. Shout out Dixie. Yeah. Dabs. There. This Liberty um, Bell. Shout out to my oh, what's your new? What's your new? <coughs> what's your new segment? <laughs> oh, yeah. That was it, man. The question and shit. Oh, but then you didn't even what? ring the bell. I was going <laughs> to play Philly music and ring the bell because it's funny, but I, then I realized that I'd probably go to jail for playing Eye of the Tiger, so I'm not going to do it. Oh, yeah. You probably would. Um, shout out to my beautiful wife, CC. And little Nick, who is, it's, it's awesome. To, you can't wait for this part when you when you can actually communicate really and know that you're not just making up that he's making the sound. It's right. Like, there's right. It's awesome. He's like, all right, this kid's at it now. Now at the point I can. It's not just her, her and him speaking their language. It's actually me and him speaking, speaking our language. language. Like, yeah, it's good. So it's cool. starting to happen. It's awesome. And shout out to uh, the farm, mom down there killing it. Boom. And uh, yesterday we had about, it was see, like a lot of guys now. There was a bunch of dudes down there, but we all had cruised down, checked it out. It was a good Sunday. <laughs> or not Sunday, it was a good uh, Tuesday, but we. Good Sunday with the dudes. No, it was Tuesday, actually. It was a good Tuesday. Tuesday. Good dudes. Dudes day. Dudes day. I'm like you now. <laughs> we were thinking about starting a bark, uh, biker gang down there because we were so many of us we're at once. Start like, the dudes day. We're going to start a biker gang. Yeah, we think we're just going to. With their it. tractors. Yeah. And the farm. Actually, no, it was Nick Nick's riding around on his, on, his, <laughs> on his tractor. He, I'm going to get him his own leathers. It's just Nick. Nick on a tractor with leather. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right, gang guy. All right, gang guy. All right, gang guy. All right, come on. What are your shout So it's my one year anniversary on the show. Fuck yeah. Hey, made it through. One year. So that means. Where's your music? I don't know. Where's my something? That you need music. I mean, I have music for, like I said, this is. I can play 30 seconds of it, and I think it's perfect. It's your one year anniversary on the show. Oh, that is good. Yeah, I mean, like, it's yeah, a big yeah. thing. Yeah. It's a milestone. <laughs> is this the song you want to play for three yeah. years? <laughs> yes, it gets, so, how can you not be happy with that? We're hoping we'll bring even cooler <laughs> stuff in the next year. <laughs> awesome. Still have ten <laughs> seconds <laughs> left. <laughs> Oh, that's all I can play legally, but it's cool. It works. Uh, yeah. Also, no, you, you don't want to hear this. Thanks, no one actually hear the lyrics anymore. So yeah, look for new terrible. stuff, better stuff in the next year. Yeah, Obviously, coming ADSI coming up. Dunno, all dunno, things dunno, our dunno, friends dunno, are bringing to play. All cool. A play shit like a no. like a play play. Like yes, a, we're gonna yes. do a stage play. We're gonna do a puppet. That's you have the leading be. role. Hand yeah. puppets. Hand puppets. Yeah. Shout out to my beautiful wife Reese. Amazing little baby Farron. Uh, the whole crew over at Boulder Wellness. Talk to you guys soon. We don't want you to smoke genetically modified ganja. We want you to smoke the real thing. We want you to smoke the natural herb. Some call it marijuana. Some call it sense media. Some call it lamb's bread. And some people call it.